Hey guys, Rob here with Spirit and Truth. Thank you so much for tuning into this sermon. I hope it speaks to you and that God can speak through you to others. I pray it blesses your life in spirit and truth. If you have any questions or prayer requests, please email us at info at spiritandtruthinternational.org. Again, that's info at spiritandtruthinternational.org. Enjoy the sermon. We are in our sermon series, Doctrine. The Lord gave us a word over our church. He said, do not worry about location. Worry about or focus on building the foundation. And part of that foundation we know is our doctrine. What do we believe? And we've been going through line by line, stanza by stanza from our website, our doctrinal statement. Because as this newly formed church family and we come together in unity around Jesus, we need to know what it is we believe and why we believe it. And so we've been going through our doctrinal statement. And the big idea of the series is that when you believe rightly about God, you will behave rightly in his world. So we've been talking about theology, which is the study of God, the knowledge of God. And today we're in our doctrinal statement, the way. We've talked about the Trinity. We've talked about the Christ. We've talked about the Bible. Today, we're talking about the way. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. He's the only way to the Father. And before we begin, I want to give you a quick intro video. So if you wouldn't mind giving your attention to the screens, we're going to watch this video and we'll dive into it. In AD 203, the Roman government arrested a 22-year-old woman, a Christian named Perpetua. The problem wasn't so much that she worshipped Jesus. Her crime was that she worshipped only Jesus. She refused to worship any other gods. As a result, she was found guilty of treason and sentenced to death. This dangerous idea that Christ alone provides the way to God is called Christian particularism, and it is as scandalous today as it was 2,000 years ago. Religious pluralism, on the other hand, is the view that all the world's religions are equally valid, and Christ is just one of many ways. Some religious pluralists say, all the world's religions teach basically the same thing, so they are all true. But this is clearly mistaken. The major religions often contradict each other. For example, compare Islam and Buddhism. Muslims believe there is a personal God who created the world. Man is sinful and will spend eternity in heaven or hell. And salvation is attained by faith and performing good works. But Buddhists deny all of this. They believe that ultimate reality is not a person. The world was not created. Man is not sinful. Man is not an enduring self. And the goal of life is not salvation, it's annihilation. Because these two worldviews contradict each other, they can't both be true. In fact, every major world religion contradicts every other one, so they can't possibly all be true. So other religious pluralists will say, all the world's religions are false. They're equally valid, but equally false, cultural expressions of mankind's search for truth. But why think that this is true? Why couldn't one particular religion be true? When you examine the arguments for religious pluralism, you find that some of them are textbook examples of logical fallacies. For example, anyone who believes that Christianity is true and every other view is wrong is arrogant. Therefore, Christianity is false. This is a logical fallacy called argument ad hominem, trying to show someone's view is false by attacking his personal character. This is a logical fallacy because the truth of a view is independent of the character of the person who holds it. For example, if an arrogant person discovered the cure for cancer, the fact that he's egotistical would not mean his claim was false and you wouldn't refuse treatment just because he was conceited. Moreover, this objection is a double-edged sword, 
For the pluralist also believes that his view is true and that everyone else is wrong. Therefore, if you're arrogant for holding to a view which many others disagree with, then the pluralist himself would be guilty of arrogance. Here is another pluralist argument. Religions are culturally relative. If you had been born in Pakistan, you'd likely be a Muslim. But if you've been born in Ireland, you'd probably be a Catholic. Because religious beliefs are culturally relative, they are not objectively true. This is an example of the genetic fallacy, trying to invalidate a view by showing how a person came to hold the view. This is a fallacy because the truth of a view is independent of how a person came to believe it. For example, if you had been born in ancient Greece, you would have believed that the sun goes around the earth. Does that make your current belief that the earth goes around the sun false or unjustified? No. Furthermore, this objection is also a double-edged sword. For if the religious pluralist had been born in Pakistan or Ireland, he'd likely have been a religious particularist. So his belief in religious pluralism is just the result of his being born in contemporary Western society and therefore is not objectively true. Getting these fallacious objections out of the way helps to reveal a more serious objection to Christian particularism. The problem of those who have never heard of Christ. If Jesus is the only way to God, then what is the fate of those who never hear of Jesus? Is there no hope for them? The answer is, there is hope for those who've never heard. The Bible says that God loves all people and wants everyone to come to Him and find eternal life. God desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. One mediator between God and man, Christ Jesus. This is the doctrine we are willing to defend at Spirit and Truth. There's only one way to the Father, and his name is Jesus. Let me give you an analogy. You wake up in the middle of the night to the smoke alarms, and the fire has engulfed most of the home and you've been trying to touch handles and distinguish which route of escape to be most efficient as to save your own life. And you don't know which door or window to take and the fireman bravely breaks through a doorway. And he says, come this way as he's engulfed in a burst of flames and he dies in front of you and you're left wondering, which door do I take? Will all routes lead to salvation? Should I try the window? Should I try this door? In, in the haze and confusion, you can't remember if that's a closet, if that's, this is a hallway. The smoke is filling your lungs. Another fireman comes, says, what are you doing? This is the way. He laid down his life. It's the only way of escape. What would you do? Would you say, but it's not fair that my house is burning? Would you say, well, why can't I go this way? I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to risk it on my own, and I'm gonna, I think all doors will lead to salvation. Or would you say, thank you. Thank you for making a way where there was no way. I'm going to run to rescue. And today, Jesus is calling out to you, and he's saying, run to rescue. Stop complaining about the fact that the plane is going down. Stop arguing with God that he will judge the living and the dead. And he has a right to grant entrance into his kingdom only those that have been born again and become his sons and daughters and that will contribute to that kingdom. And he has a right to vanquish and to throw into the lake of fire, into hell, God's jail without parole, all those who are wicked and evil and will bring the gangrene infection of sin into eternity. He has a right as a good king to say, no, you cannot come in. So you can sit there and complain and say, well, I, I don't believe in hell. Hell is there whether you believe in it or not. Well, I don't think God would throw me into hell. You're on the path of the wrath of God. Don't you know what Jesus said? 
I didn't come to condemn the world because it stood condemned already. Because you have not obeyed the Lord your God. You've loved the darkness rather than the light. You love your sin. So the conviction of God is not, oh, one day God is going to throw me into hell. I need to repent simply to please him. That, sound, that, that, that is a true statement. And yet, the real revelation is I'm already on the path. I'm already living in hell. I'm already bringing hell into this life. It already fills my heart. And that's the destination I'm already on the path to. And Jesus came to rescue me from the burning building. Do you see it that way? Or do you see it that your house is fine, but on the day of judgments, Jesus is going to come and light the match? No, 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 my friends. God is gracious and merciful and loving and kind. He's not sadistic. He's not malicious, malevolent. He's not going to try and burn your house down. It's already burning. Because that's what sin did. Our rebellion did that. Our lies, our lust, our pride, our selfishness, our adultery. We burn the house down. Satan and his demons burn the house down. You know that's what hell was made for originally? Satan and the demons. I'm pleading with you, run to rescue this morning. Run to rescue. Why would you sit there and debate the route? Could the Muslim God be the route? Could the Hindu gods be the route? Why? Why not just say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you for forgiving me and dying for me. And so it's my hope this morning that as we go into scripture, God's revelation about himself, you will see that he's the only way. You won't take my word for it. You won't just take the video's word for it, although very educational and true. You would come to a revelation of the knowledge of God that Jesus Christ is the only way of escape. Look at our doctrinal statement the way. We believe that apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ, all men are lost and face the judgment of God. That Jesus is the only way, say only way, to the Father. And that the repentance of sin and faith in Christ results in regeneration by the Holy Spirit and eternal salvation. Let's take it line by line, saving work. Luke 24, 46 through 47 says, He told them, this is what is written, the Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead. And on the third day, repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Ephesians 1, 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Here at Spirit and Truth, we believe that salvation is found in Jesus Christ, in his shed blood on the cross, his sacrifice for you. We call this the propitiation, substitutionary atonement, that he substituted his life for you and paid for all your crimes. A few weeks ago, Pastor Paul from Grace Church of Arvada did a great job explaining that exchange, that he paid off your debt, that he changed names on your bank account with his. He gave you his righteousness. We gave him all of our sin and corruption. It's amazing good news. And so in some ways, you could actually say you're saved by works. Well, Rob, I thought you said that we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and you would be correct. But we're saved by works, just not your own. We're saved by the work of Jesus Christ. The work that he put into the cross, the work of the incarnation, where he threw off immortality and glory to come and wrap himself in flesh. None of you would have the love and compassion to do that. So before you start pointing the finger at God saying, well, why would you send the flood? And why would you have Sodom and Gomorrah and rain down fireballs? And why would you have hell? Time out. Why would you send yourself 
in the likeness of sinful flesh to die for guilty sinners who didn't deserve it and come back from the dead after being brutally executed and tortured? That's the question. God is both just and merciful. He is holy and loving. The work that he put in, the sweat for 30 years as a blue collar carpenter worker just to relate to you and to take care of his own family, particularly leaving a retirement for his mom because his dad passed away. The work that he put into preaching and teaching and countless nights of ministry and healing all that would come to him. And we know it was exhausting because the power of God would move through him and he would get thirsty and hungry. The work of training these 12 men who were ornery and who at some times, just like all of us in the room, were incompetent. And at other times, who showed a lot of promise and potential. The work as Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane fighting a spiritual battle we could never understand. Saying, God, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to be separated from you. We've been in eternal triune love and harmony. And for a moment, that was going to be severed as the wrath of God was poured out on your sacrifice, on your hero, your substitute. The work as Jesus endured the lashes, the work as he carried the cross, so physically exhausted, they, they had to find Simon the Cyrene to carry it all the way up to Golgotha. The work as he endured longer than anyone thought possible as he hung on the cross. The work as he went down into the depths after he breathed his last breath and said, it is finished. He went down for three days. It says he preached to the captives in Sheol. He did work in those three days. It says he took the keys of death in Hades. Keys signify authority to access. He took the keys. He got access back so when we die, we can have eternal life. The work when he appeared to 500 witnesses and restored Peter and set up the early church. The work is he ascended into the clouds and he sent the Holy Spirit. You are saved by works. Just the work of Jesus Christ. Judgment of God. We believe apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ, all men are lost and face the judgment of God. John 3, 17 through 18, I mentioned it earlier. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they've not believed in the name of God's one and only son. This is the verdict. Light came into the world, but people loved darkness instead of the light because their deeds were evil. You can give me all the intellectual reasons you want to not believe in Jesus Christ. And I'm willing to wrestle those out with you, and God is too, because he wants your faith to have reason, not just to be blind. But you can give me all those excuses. You can give me all the emotional, mental, and health excuses to not pursue God, not believe in God. You could give me the bitterness and how God lets you down and how he must not be real and how there's evil in the world and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, the Bible says you love your sin. You're trapped in it. You're addicted to it. You hate it, but you love it. And Jesus came and said, you know that thing that you love and you hate and that's killing you and everyone around you? I can set you free. I forgive you for that. And because we actually don't believe it, we're like, there's no way you could forgive me. There's no way you could restore me. There's no way you could heal me and help, help me overcome this habit pattern and this addiction. So I'll just believe you're not real. And at least I'll get a temporary fleeting pleasure out of this life. And Jesus says, I've got so much more for you. If you would just repent of that. I'm not a killjoy. I'm here to bring you the fullness of joy. I'm not trying to keep you from fun and pleasure. I'm trying to actually give you pleasure evermore that doesn't come with consequence. 
2 Corinthians 5.10, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may be recompensed, that means paid back for his deeds in the body, according to what he has done, whether good or bad. We believe here at Spirit and Truth that you will stand before the judge. You will give an account for your life. And notice how it didn't say you will be judged and, and recompensed for your faith. You will be recompensed, meaning paid back for your deeds. Oh, Rob, you're confusing me again. You said it's by faith and by grace. And now here we are again with works and deeds. That's right. God will judge the world based on works, either your works. Trust me, you do not want to receive the full weight of the law against your works or Jesus's work. The works will be judged. But when you're in Christ, when you're hidden in Christ, when you took the plea bargain, I'm guilty, I accept your grace and mercy. Thank you for your forgiveness. I am hidden in Christ. I have a new heart. I'm adopted into his family. I'm going to inherit eternity. When that happens, God looks at you on that day. Your file of all the things you've ever done is exchanged for Jesus's. He looks at the file and he says, you're clear. You are perfect. Well, Father, I wasn't perfect. No. You are perfect in Christ. But if you reject Jesus, I don't want your sacrifice. I don't want your atonement. I don't want your life. You're telling God, I want to be judged on my own merit. Wow. That's a dangerous place to be. You want to stand before the judge of the living and the dead, the king of kings, who's never sinned, who clearly set forth in his 10 commandments and beyond his righteous standard as just an example. It's barely scratching the surface of how holy he is. Don't tell a lie. Don't covet. Have no other gods before me. Jesus then, when he came, he reiterated some of them and said, hey, lusting is the same as adultery. Hating is the same as murder. He's trying to show the people, wake up. None of you on your own merit can make it. It's impossible. So I'm pleading with you. I'm not saying try harder. I'm not saying clean yourself up. I'm not saying, you know, start adding good works to the scale. Well, here's all my bad deeds. Huh. I'm just going to weigh the scale out with good deeds. It'll never work. A good judge doesn't fall for that anyway. You're guilty of these thousands of crimes. But I also walked an old lady across the street. Oh, okay, you're free to go. Like, no, no judge would do that. They're going to say, look, I don't care about that. What I care about is who's going to pay for this? Who's going to do the time for the crime? But if you say, hey, I plead guilty. I know I'm a guilty sinner, but Jesus Christ was perfect and I'm, I'm with him. Hey, I'm with him. The judge will look at the son. And by the way, Jesus Christ is the judge, but he'll take, he'll take off his black robe and set down his gavel and he'll say, welcome son or daughter. Welcome good and faithful servant. Come into the kingdom that I've prepared for you. Earl, he'll say, depart from me. I never really knew you. So we have two different things in scripture, two different images of the judgment seat. One is the image of relationship. Come, faithful servant. Depart from me. I don't know you. So we have relational language and then we have legal language judged and recompensed by your deeds. Do you see the gospel? You have to pick one. You want religion. People, it's so funny. People say, well, I'm not religious. Actually, you are. Christians are the only ones that can claim that because what we're saying is we're, we have relationship with God and that's my only merit. That's the only thing that is redeeming about me, that God will spare me because I know him. What you're saying is, I think I can do it on my own without God. Well, let's see how that works out on judgment day. You're the one doing your religious deeds and your social justice and your virtue signaling. Oh yeah, it might not be going to church. And let, let's say you're an atheist who's non-religious, you, but you are religious. Your good deeds are just giving a little bit to charity and paying your taxes and wearing your mask and virtue signaling. And you, it's a righteousness on the outside, but there's no righteousness on the inside. So you're the religious one. 
so funny. I hate, I shouldn't say hate. I very dislike when people say, I'm not religious. Like, well, neither are we. And you are actually. <laughs> I have a relationship with God and you're going to stand before God and be paid back for your works. I'm going to stand before God and I'm going to know him. Thank you, Jesus, by his grace. Not in and of myself, but because he's called me. He's predestined me. And he's elected you, if you will believe. We believe that apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ, all men are lost and face the judgment of God that Jesus is the only way. Only way. John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Don't let anyone fool you and say, well, Jesus never taught that. All religions lead to the same road. That is a lie. And when the firefighter's standing there and you're in the burning house, run to rescue. I don't know where people get that idea. It's from their college professors. It's from people that don't know God. That say, well, all religions teach the same thing. No, they don't. This is the claim Jesus was willing to die for, are you? This is the claim that the martyrs throughout the ages died for. Say there's another way, renounce Jesus as the only way, or we'll burn you at the stake. And they said, go ahead and burn me. Because it's either fact or it's not, you guys. Like this is either reality or it's lies and manipulation. It can't be halfway. It can't be Jesus is a way. No, either it's all a sham or it's true. And based on the miracles, based on the prophecies, based on the resurrection of Jesus, based on the life change sitting right in front of you and many people in this room that we are not the people we used to be by the grace of God, it's true. All the evidence points to the fact that it's true. So you might think it's insensitive, Rob, to tell people that Jesus is the only way. Not if it's true. If it's true, it's the most loving thing I could do. Acts 4.12, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name, say no other name, name. under heaven given to mankind by which we must be saved. We believe that apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ, all men are lost and face the judgment of God that Jesus is the only way to the Father and that repentance of sin and faith in Christ. Repentance of sin. This is controversial because some would say faith alone means repentance doesn't play a part. Repentance is the act of turning away from your will to God's will. It begins with a change of mind, but it concludes with a change of life. Some ministers simplify repentance to only a changing of the thinking, metanoia in the Greek. Other ministers say, no, no, it's, it's actually willing your decision to change. And they're both right. You transform your mind the way you think and believe about yourself, God, and the world, and your behavior will follow. If the behavior is not following, though, you have room to doubt whether you really believe it. So it's a change of mind and a change of life. And we believe it's spirit and truth. It's actually part of salvation. Like, that's controversial. Some of you might not think that, praise God. But... We actually believe it's part of the deal. It's part of the package. That true faith. You are saved by faith alone. Faith alone. Grace alone. But true faith will be repentance. Repentance is, in Hebrews 6.1, it says, the elementary doctrine. Laying the foundation of repentance from dead works and faith towards God. Look what it says in Acts 17.30. In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent. He commands it. 
look, this isn't Rob's idea. Well, I don't know, Rob. I, I just, what about John 3, 16? Whosoever believes. Yes, of course, belief, faith. That is the saving work of God in your heart. His saving work on the cross. There's a saving work in your heart and mind called belief, which produces a saving work in your life called the keeping of repentance. But repentance is involved. God's commanding it. He didn't, Paul on the Aragopagus there before the Athenians, he could have said anything. He could have said, and God just commands you to uh, believe in him. And others did preach that. Peter preached that. I just said John wrote it. But you have to interpret scripture in light of all scripture. Okay? Scripture is not meant to be read like a fortune cookie. It's meant to be read like a library. The volume set. You've got to read them all. And so it's very clear when you read all of scripture, repentance is part of the deal. You can't just say, yeah, God, I believe in you, but I'm going to continue in my sin, folly, and rebellion because then there's a disconnect here. Part of believing in him is turning and actually running back to him. And then that faith, that belief is now producing righteousness, sanctification, holiness. I explain it to my son this way. Son, I want you to run down the sidewalk as fast as you can. When I say the word repent, I want you to stop, do a 180, and sprint back to dad. He didn't even know what the word repent is. I love teaching little kids this. What is repentance? Run, stop, spin, run. He's running. <laughs> repent. Boom. I got you, buddy. Rob, are you saying that if I sin, I'm unsaved? No, we've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. What I'm saying is part of salvation is acknowledging that you're a sinner and turning your back on that lifestyle and asking Jesus, believing in Jesus, loving Jesus. And then there's a process of putting your sin to death. That takes time. Okay, look at Hebrews 6.1. I mentioned it earlier, but... Let's read it again. Therefore, let us move beyond the elementary teachings about Christ and be taken forward to maturity. God wants to grow you up. Not laying again the foundation of, here's the very first foundational pylon of Christianity. Ready? Repentance from acts that lead to death and faith in God. Repentance from dead works and faith towards God. And there's a debate in the church about this and there shouldn't be because it's, it's paradoxical. People will say, the people that emphasize repentance, oh, you're leaning on works too much and you're abusing grace and faith. The people that lean on faith and grace and just belief alone, the argument is, well, you're actually teaching people that they can have God and their sin and they can't. And there's no change of life. And what you're creating is fake Christians and converts maybe to church going, but they haven't actually been born again. And there's this debate. And here at Spirit and Truth, like everything we do, we're going to hold the tension. Spirit and truth. House church and the gathering. Spiritual awakening and cultural transformation. Three and one. Jesus is God and man. The Bible is a, written by the Holy Spirit and the prophets and apostles. And you're saved by repentance, faith alone, grace alone. We can talk more about that if you're struggling. Come talk to me after. Faith in Christ. Ephesians, or I'm sorry, Galatians. 2.16. So repentance of sin and faith in Christ. That's a package deal. Look at this. Galatians 2.16. Know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, meaning their works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. And based on what we already learned, you could put a little parenthesis there, faith in Jesus Christ and his works of the law. Thank you, Jesus. So we too have put our faith in Christ Jesus that we might be justified. That's a courtroom term. That means you are not guilty justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no one will be justified. It's very clear. You are not saved by works of your own. Praise God, because that would be hell to pay. We already know that. We've talked about it. 
Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is where we get that phrase, by grace through faith. This is where it comes from. Not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. I love that language, gift. Do you pay for a gift? But someone else did. I love that. People say, well, grace is free, therefore it must be cheap. Oh, no, 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 my friend. Grace is free, but it came at a very high price. The price of God himself giving his breath for you, his blood for you, his life for you. Never tasted pain until he was born. He didn't have to go through what he went through, but he did for us. I love that language, gift. If I hand you my iPhone and say, here, it's free. You don't owe me anything. Well, but, but, but can I work for it? No, no. I don't want you to work for it. It's free. You wouldn't say, well, it's worthless. Throw it in the trash, right? You'd say, well, thank you. This is incredible. Because you know it's expensive and costly. And it continues to get more and more expensive for these things. Oh, man. <laughs> We all know Apple plans for them to fail, so we have to buy new ones. And I know, yes, right, Samsung. A whole other sermon about how big tech is corrupt that I want to preach right this second, but I can't. <laughs> and how we probably shouldn't be using Apple products anyway. We believe that apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ, all men are lost and face the judgment of God, that Jesus is the only way to the Father, and that repentance of sin and faith in Christ results in regeneration. Regeneration. What is this word? What does regeneration mean? We know when your cells regenerate, it means they're creating new ones, new life. Your body's healing itself. The Bible uses this word, it's a theological word, but it's actually found in Scripture, and it, it, it means new heart, new desires. Guys, I think this might be the best part of the good news. There's so many things in the good news. God loves you. Oh, that's amazing, right? He paid it all for you, so you don't have to pay for your own sins. Well, that's incredible. He's granted you eternal life instead of eternal death can't even fathom that one. They're all great. But this part of the good news, he can change your desires. He, can, he doesn't just forgive you for being corrupt and leave you corrupt. He takes the cancer out. He takes the sin desires out. I love this. Somehow this gets missed in the gospel. Look, God will forgive you, but you're going you're gonna to want to keep sinning the rest of your life, and you're just going to be a sinner the rest of your life, and thank God he's just going to have mercy on you, pagan sinner, and grant you eternal life even though you're just a sinner. It's like, no, you, you were once a sinner. Now you're a saint. The Bible says, what benefit did you get from the things that you're now ashamed of? It says, yes, we were all once enemies of God, but now we have been transferred into the glorious inheritance of the saints. It uses this language, yes, you were once, but now, and somehow Christians don't get this. You actually have to believe your identities change. You have a new heart with new desires. You are a slave to righteousness. Look at what it says, prophesied all the way back in the Old Testament, Jeremiah 31, 33. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time. Meaning this is the new covenant declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. Ezekiel 36, 26. I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you and I will remove your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. Guys, it's been prophesied. There's many, many verses I could go through in the New Testament as well about you getting a new heart and new desires and being a slave to righteousness now, which means you actually want to do the, wrong, the right thing. It grieves you when you do the wrong thing. Do you make mistakes? Sure. But when it happens, you turn from it back to God. He forgives you. 
you overcome, you get better, you put sin to death, you're in a process called sanctification. And all the while, you're actually wanting the right things now. You want God to be pleased with you. You want to love him more. You want to turn away from the things you know he is displeased with. This is the some of the best news in the good news, genuinely. If you, if you can catch this. And what you need to ask yourself then is, why am I still desiring this sin? Because if you can change that, the habit will be easy to break. You know, to be frank, let's, let's use an example that everyone's familiar with. Pornography is an addiction that plagues our world and our church. Young and old, male and female. We know primarily young men but it's, it's infected everyone and everywhere at this point. I had an addiction in high school that God broke when we first came to know the Lord because I actually believed it took some renewing of my mind, but I actually came to believe I was already pure and I was already free. And it also came with an immense sacrifice. I took a machete to my laptop and destroyed it because I didn't have smartphones back then. And I went without a laptop for two years. My mom's like, what did you do? I said, you don't understand this thing. I had to put it on the altar. I mean, it was <laughs> very intense. And it was my sister's machete from Brazil on the mission trip. So I'm like, this is a missionary sword. It just felt, it's, you know, this is, this is a holy sword and this is a sinful machine. And now I came to learn in college that, that lust, and I knew this, but lust is here. And Jesus didn't want to just break the habit of the pornography, which he does because it is addicting and it is like cocaine and the dopamine rush can corrupt your brain. Just do your own research, you guys, and look what happens to the brain of porn addicts and how it distorts your morality. And when you lose your moral compass, how you can get into forms of depravity and, and get further and further away from God's design. And the, the dark hole of wickedness just brings you to a place you never thought you would go and you don't recognize yourself anymore. God can redeem you from that. God is gracious and he can reach into the depths of the pit and pull you out. But you gotta get some light on it. The only way is you gotta confess it. You gotta get light on it. You gotta bring it to the open. You gotta be blunt and vulnerable with some men in your life about what's really going on and how severe it is and what kind of things you're clicking on and going to. But here's the deal. There was a point where in college and in, into early marriage, this, this lust thing would rear its ugly head about once a year, once every six months. And I just thought, well, this is as good as it's gonna get. Like I'm, I'm lust free but then these little thoughts will come in and I'll, I'll just, I wrestle with them, I battle them and I struggle with this. And it's just, I, I guess this is as much victory as, as I'm gonna get. It's, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty free. And I watched a John Bevere series called Porn Free. And if you struggle with that, please watch John Bevere's Porn Free. It is free, no pun intended. Um, just download Messenger X and watch it. But in this, he talks about regeneration being one of the key points to freedom. The regeneration, meaning when your desires actually change. You, you can't, let me say it this way, you can't hunger for something you have no appetite for. Something that you don't like that repulses you, when your taste buds change, how many people know your taste buds can change <laughs> for actual food? When you start to get repulsed by the very thing you used to love to consume, you won't eat it anymore. And he gave a testimony of how he was in a, after being lust free, not just porn free, but lust free, every thought captive, no lust. It can happen, it is possible, and we're walking in it, praise God. And any momentary slip, boom, confession, light, repentance, we get back on track. And that's what you do, that's how you fight sin, that's how you put it to death, that's the only way. Now listen. <sighs> John Bevere says he was in a hotel room and he flipped the channels and, this th and he hadn't seen images like that in a long time and they come on the screen and he actually was sick to his stomach. He changed the channel and he actually almost puked because he was repulsed by it. He didn't think, oh, I really want that, but I better put this remote, ah, throw it, you know, I better run away. Now there are times where you need to, your habits are changing and you need to flee from sexual immorality, the Bible says, just flee from it. 
But what I'm saying is when your appetite changes, when your heart changes, when you long to please God more than you want the sin, that's the game changer. And I can walk you through that process and Micah can too, and, you, and, and let's do it together. But this is just one example of regeneration, okay? Eternal salvation, last point here today, we'll wrap up. We believe that apart from the saving work of Jesus Christ, all men are lost and face the judgment of God, that Jesus is the only way to the Father, that repentance of sin and faith in Christ results in regeneration by the Holy Spirit and eternal salvation. Look at Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Look at that language, wages versus gift. Come on, this is the gospel. Wages are what? Something you've earned. Gift is something you have not earned. The wages of sin. God owes you something. He owes you a paycheck. Payday. For your sin. Your sin has accumulated a debt. And there's a recompense to be made. A payday to be made. And he already paid it on the cross. He already paid it. But if you refuse that, say, I don't want the check that will actually clear. I don't want your saving work. I'm going to try to pay it with my own money, my own bank account. That's negative a million. And you go to cut that check, what's it going to do? It's going to bounce. The wages of sin is death. You've earned, you've worked throughout your life. Your rejection of God and your godless ways have earned something. The wages, and it's called death, eternal death, separation from God. But the gift of God, freely, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. I love that contrast. Stop walking in a life of what you've earned. Stop wallowing in self-pity. If you continue, no wonder people are depressed. Well, Rob, I struggle with depression and anxiety and self-loathing and self-harm and suicide, confusion. And well, no wonder you're stuck. There's wages coming. (laughs) You've earned, you've, you've earned death and you're living in it. You're actively living dead. That's what the Bible says. You're dead in your sins and trespasses, but thanks be to Christ Jesus who made us alive according to his riches and mercy. Look at Titus 3, 4 through 7. But when the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out upon us richly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Guys, this summarizes my entire sermon today. Let's break down this verse and then we'll pray and wrap this up. When the kindness of God, he is a good God. Don't you think for one second he's unkind? Our Savior, he is the hero of the story. You're not the hero. If you try to be the protagonist, your story is going to continue to fail. You try to make it about you and your glory and your pleasure, it's going to fail. You make it all about God, and the side benefit is you're going to have peace and hope and life and joy. When the kindness of God, our Savior, and his love for mankind appeared, when did that happen? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ made the love of God appear in the flesh, in person. He saved us, not by the basis of deeds, which we have done in righteousness. You have to acknowledge, you have to come to the conclusion that your deeds will not make it. And if you're so proud that you actually think you're that good of a person, you need to start reading the Bible. Because that's part of what the Bible does. It's a mirror, the Bible says, that shows you who you really are. And you realize, my face is dirty. You're walking around with black charcoal all over your face and you don't even know it. So get in the mirror. Get in the word of God. Not so that you can beat yourself up. So that you can say, wow, I need a savior to clean me up. Not so that you try harder to clean yourself. So you say, God, I need Jesus. I need him to wash me whiter than snow. Guys, every time... Every single time I'm, I'm taking a shower, TMI, 
every time that with that soap and it suds up and it's white, I think of that passage for some reason, the white as snow, just he cleanses you from all unrighteousness. I just, I imagine that I'm actually being cleansed like a baptismal, that his mercies are new every morning, that I, not only am I clean physically, I'm actually clean on the inside. But according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, he poured out richly through Christ Jesus. So he gave you a helper. He gave you the power. He gave you, without the Holy Spirit, well, no wonder there's so many addicted Christians and wayward Christians and apostate Christians and unbelieving Christians. Because they don't have the Holy Spirit. They've grieved him. They don't talk to him. They don't worship him. They haven't repented of, to him. Some people have never even heard of him. But he's give you He's given you the Holy Spirit so that being justified, meaning not guilty, by his grace, you'd also be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. In that last verse, it's so important because all three, I've taught this before, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. Justified, sanctified, glorified. We've gone over this before. Justified happens at the moment when you place your faith in Jesus and you are declared not guilty. Sanctified is the lifelong process by which the Holy Spirit conforms you into the image and likeness of Christ. And then glorified is the final day when you see Jesus face to face and you get a brand new body and sin is removed. Justified, the penalty of sin done away. Sanctified, the power of sin overcome. Glorified, the presence of sin removed. And in this verse, you see all three in that very last line. So that being justified by his grace, we would be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. So I want to give you an opportunity today, if you've never placed your faith in Jesus as the only way, maybe you've heard about Jesus, maybe you have even gone to church, but you haven't trusted in him alone and his payment, his work, his life, burial, death, and resurrection for your salvation. I want to give you that moment right now. So would you bow your heads with me? Would you close your eyes? 